Let me say first, I appreciate your prayers this week on my behalf. Uh, had some difficulties with this old ticker again, and uh, I was dreading the, the uh, view from where I was looking at anyway. But uh, the Lord answered prayer, and I give him praise and glory this morning for it. How many times have I prayed for others, but I appreciate your prayers on my behalf and uh, thinking about us. Many promises in his word concerning us, admonishing us to talk to him and bring our needs before him. And I give him praise for that too, amen? I mean the promises of his word to us. In Psalms, 100, uh, no, in Psalms 55 and verse 22, he said, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. God's able to hold you up. Many celebrate what uh, they find uh, when they begin to go to a tomb or uh, to remember somebody. But when we go to the tomb, we celebrate because it's empty. See, he's not there anymore. But he's sitting on the right hand of the Father, according to Hebrews 7.25. And uh, he's making intercession for you and I. So not only were you praying, but the Lord was praying too, and I give him praise this morning. We're going to have a time of prayer around the altar. I want to remember many that still having difficulties with this old body. And uh, trust, if you uh, would like to join us, you feel free to do so. We just love the Lord, believe his word, and uh, desire to pray and talk to him and take our needs before him, not only ours, but others as well. If you want to join us, you feel free.
be able to sing like that and uh, that's good singing right there and uh, but better than the singing I'm thankful for the song because he lives amen and uh, thank you so much for being here and just excited to see what God has for us on this Easter Sunday if you have your Bibles take them out and open them up to the book of Matthew this morning the book of Matthew chapter 28 and uh, next Sunday we're gonna begin a series called living a life of victory Truly, we are living in a time where we all have our valley days, our tough days, our challenging days, but we still, as a Christian, we can still live a life of victory, and we'll begin that on next Sunday. I hope that you'll be in your place and be here, and uh, looking forward to that, but thank you so much for being here this morning. The book of Matthew, chapter 28, this morning, and uh, all those that are willing and able, we're going to stand for the reading of God's Word, just a few verses here, Matthew chapter 8. Uh, 28 and uh, we're going to begin in verse 1 and uh, see what God has for us on this resurrection Sunday. Matthew chapter 28, the Bible tells us here beginning in verse 1, in the end of the Sabbath as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher and behold there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake, became as dead men. 
Verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Verse 6, He is not here, I like this, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Thank you, you can be seated this morning. As you're sitting back down, I'd like for you to look back at verse 6. This would be our text verse this morning out of this passage of Scripture. Once again, here, a verse that we've read many times, a verse that many people will read today throughout America as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. But I like this verse here in the account of Matthew. It says, He is not here, for He is risen. I like this next part also, as He said. Amen? He is not here, for He is risen. Just this past thir uh, Thursday, the story broke of a 37-year-old man from South Carolina, and maybe you heard this, this just happened, just, just like I said, this past Thursday. He was rescued after spending more than two months alone in a sailboat at sea. Living on fish and rainwater, the U.S. Coast Guard reported. The crew of the Houston Express, a German flagship, reported to the Coast Guard that they found Lewis Jordan and his sailboat Angel around 1.30 p.m. on this past Thursday, approximately 200 miles east of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. A Coast Guard helicopter flew out to the Express and took him to Norfolk, Virginia, the article said there at the hospital, where he was treated for an injured shoulder, the news uh, reported. From what he told us on the phone, he was catching fish and collecting rainwater and drank it, and that's how he survived for two months. I'm so glad you're alive, his father, Frank Lewis, uh, Frank Jordan, Lewis's father, told him on the phone. He said, we prayed and prayed and prayed and hoped you were still alive. His dad went on to say these words, I thought I lost you, he said emotionally to the camera and to his father, to his son. Davis, his mom, uh, Lewis's uh, mother, she said this. She said, we are looking forward to the celebrating our son's return. She said these in quotes. We do plan on having a wonderful Easter celebration with family, and I can't wait to get him back, she said. Why were they so excited? Because their son, who they thought was dead, was truly alive. And this morning we have a, a Jesus Christ who did die, but can I tell us this morning, he is alive, amen. And this morning for the next few moments, I wanna preach on this title, this topic this morning, just simply, he lives, he lives. Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we love you. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, for just another opportunity to come to your house and worship you. Father, we thank you for the songs. We thank you for the music. We thank you for the people, Lord God, that make up this place. And Father, we are so grateful today that we serve a Savior that's not dead. But God, you are alive today. And God, we thank you for that. And Lord, as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, Lord, we're grateful. And God, I pray as we look at this and we, as we look at your word, Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would help us this morning. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would truly show yourself real. We love you. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Today, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's what we call, many people call it, Resurrection Sunday. All across America today, many will celebrate the day with chocolate rabbits, some candy eggs, and coloring of boiled eggs, just like many of us has done. Families will gather for a time of reunion, a time of food, and then a time to play hide and seek with those bold and plastic filled candy eggs. However, today though, we might all do that and we might get around our family's house today at some time and do those things. May we never forget this morning truly though, what Easter is all about. May we never today, or may we realize that Easter is much more than chocolate. It's much, much more than an Easter bunny and it's much more than a colored hard boiled egg, amen. If I can just say it this way this morning, he lives. Amen. He lives. Though we as a church will today take today and 
we will remember our Savior who died and rose again on the third day. The truth of the matter is this, church, this morning, truly every Sunday we should celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Truth be known, every Sunday is Easter Sunday, amen. Why? Because He lives. He lives this morning. Oh, last week we began talking about, as we prepared for this special Sunday, we prepared talking about what Jesus did on Calvary's cross, and we looked at the sounds from the cross. We looked at the sounds from the cross here in the book of Matthew, and we kind of looked at it as we stepped into the picture and looked to see what Jesus did for us. Instead of just reading it and looking at it, we tried to listen and hear maybe the sounds that came from that day that Jesus laid his life down for us. We saw the sounds of betrayal, how Judas betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. We talked about the sounds of persuasion. And we remember the story, we've heard it before, how the chief priest persuaded the people to crucify Jesus and to let Barabbas go. We talked about the sounds of suffering and in shame and what Jesus did for us on Calvary's cross. We've all heard it from the littlest to the youngest. We've heard what Jesus had done for us and how he took our suffering and our shame for us. The sounds of death we talked about on last Sunday when he said it is finished. The pain and suffering was finished. My father is honored as he said, this is finished. But more importantly, as he said that, hey, he was saying it is finished, saying, hey, I have done this. I have died on the cross for you. Last Sunday, we talked about the sounds of salvation, how the centurion guard truly looked at Jesus on the cross. And as Jesus took his last breath, the centurion guard looked and said, truly, this was the man of God. And on that day, he realized who God was. Last week, we left Christ on the cross as he took his last breath. But praise the Lord this morning, church, he's not still on the cross. Amen. Praise the Lord this morning. You see, God isn't dead. As that popular song out that's out is God's not dead. And can I truly say this? God truly isn't dead. Amen. Just as a sailor who was found this past Thursday, though he was alive and found alive, our God, our Jesus, our Savior, he was dead. But listen this morning, he is alive. He lives. The guards couldn't chain him. I got to thinking about this. The grave couldn't stop him. The still tomb couldn't hold him. The chief priest couldn't restrain him. The people couldn't hinder him. This world can't subdue him. Hey, listen, this morning, he lives. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. And we truly, this morning, church, have a reason to celebrate. It's more better than any Easter bunny. He's more better than any plastic eel filled egg. I wrote this down. He's even better than those Easter baskets filled with that crazy green plastic grass that gets everywhere. You know what I'm talking about. And listen, he's better than those Reese's peanut butter eggs. And those things are good too. I'm talking about put them in the freezer, get them. Those are good. But he's better than that. Hey, he's better than any marshmallow peeps. He's better than any jelly beans. This morning, he lived. Brother Ryan just sung a song this morning that says, Because He Lives. We know that it was written in the, in the 1960s by Bill and Gloria Gaither. And the words pinned to that, the most, one of the most famous Southern gospel songs of all time, Because He Lives. Because He Lives, listen church, I can face tomorrow. Because He Lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future and life is worth the living just because. Amen. He lives. This morning, may we be reminded of why we celebrate today. He lives. This morning, just for the next few moments here, I want to talk about because he lives. I want us to see number one, because he lives, there is hope. Hey, because Jesus lives, number one, may we be reminded this morning as we look at this passage of Scripture that there is hope. If you wouldn't mind, look back there in verse 6 of chapter 28. The Bible says he's not here, for he is risen, as he said. And then the angel talking to Mary looks at those ladies, and this is what the angel says. The angel says, come and see the place where the Lord lay. As Mary came to the tomb that resurrection morning, she was startled to find the empty tomb. Of course, she came there with her ointment. She came there to see Jesus. She came there to get him ready as he had passed away. But as she came to that tomb that day, she was startled at what she saw as the angel looked at her and said these words, He is not here. He is risen. 
come see the place where he lay. Could you imagine when she came there? Could you imagine her heart? Could you imagine the heartbeats of them as they came bouncing out of their chest as they came to see Jesus, the person they loved, the person they cared for, and as they came there, he wasn't there. The angel said, come and see the place where he lay. He is risen, he lives. The angel said, go see for yourself. What was the angel saying that morning? What was it the angel was trying to say? He was saying, hey, I'm just telling you there is proof that he is risen. Look at the tomb, it's empty, he's not there. There lies the hope we have in Jesus Christ, amen? Come see the place where he lay. Now I think of that word hope and I think about the world's definition of hope and this is what I thought of. The world's definition of hope, when we think about this, because he lives, church, we can, there is a hope, but the world's definition of hope is this. I hope it rains. It's wishful thinking. I hope they don't call me into work this weekend. Anybody had that thought? I hope they don't call me into work. Hey, I hope they cancel school, especially when they, the, the, the kids are hoping that it snows, and I hope they cancel school. You see, that type of hope, the world's type of hope is wishful thinking. It may or may not come to pass. But the biblical definition of hope is this, church, confident expectation. Confident expectation. Wrote it down this way. Hope <clears throat> as a Christian is a firm assurance regarding things that are unclear and unknown. Hope is a fundamental component of the life of the righteous. Without hope, life loses its meaning and in death there is no hope. The righteous, who put our, put, the righteous who trust or put their hope in God will be helped and they will not be confounded, put to shame or disappointed. The righteous who have this trustful hope in God have a general confidence in God's protection and help and are free from fear and anxiety. And may I just say this this morning, because Jesus Christ this morning lives, we can and there is a hope, amen? There is a hope, and I'm so grateful for that this morning. We think of the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If the tomb wasn't empty, there would be no hope for us, church. If the tomb was still sealed and Jesus' body was still laid in the tomb, there would be no hope for each and every one of us. Because he lives, there is hope. But also, number two, I want us to see this this morning. Because Jesus lives, there is help. Amen? Verse 20 says this. It says, teaching them, there in Matthew 28, verse 20, the Bible says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, look at these next words. I am with you. And what's it say? I am with you always. Listen, disciples, listen, church. I want you to know something. I have risen, and I am, I have risen, and I want you to know something. Hey, I am with you always. What a help. Hey, what a great thing to know that Jesus, though he is risen and though he is, he is in heaven today, he's still there with us, and what a great help he is to us. Amen. Hey, because he lives, there is help. And Jesus tells the disciples this after his resurrection. You see this morning, because he lives, there truly is help. Have you ever been in a place in need when you needed help? Have you ever been in a point in life when you just didn't know what to do? When you just didn't know how you was going to handle it? You didn't know how you could keep going on? I thought of a silly illustration as I was one day. It was late at night and I'd left to go do something. I don't remember. And we were living in Walnut Grove at the time. And I remember I jumped in my truck and I jumped in my truck so quick, I, I didn't even grab my phone uh, or anything. I don't know if I was going to pick up the kids or something or at a friend's house and it was real late at night and where we lived, it was dark. I'm talking about dark, dark, dark. And uh, I jumped in that truck and I remember taking off and going down the road and it had been a new truck, a new used truck I'd gotten and I didn't, I didn't know it all real well, Brother Jeff. And I got in that thing and I went and I was coming home and I was several miles from home and all of a sudden that thing started going, started sputtering. I went, oh no. I looked at the gas gauge and that thing said that I had gas. And all of a sudden that thing stopped. I'm talking about, and if anybody knows anything about me, I'll just tell you, I'll, I know I have to turn in my man card on this, but I don't like the dark. All right, that's where the boogeyman lives. I don't like the dark, I'll just tell you. Especially when you don't know where you're at. 
especially when you think you're looking around and I got out of that thing and I went to grab my phone to call Amy to come get her. Oh no, I left it at home. I, didn't, I couldn't call anybody. I didn't know what to do. Here I am out in the dark miles from home. I'm thinking, what am I gonna do? I'm looking around and every little sound I'm listening. Cause I mean, listen, when you get out in the dark all by yourself, you hear all kinds of sound. I mean, the dogs. I mean, you hear things you've never even heard of before. You're thinking, what is that? A Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot or something. There was no one around. I needed help. And I remember then, I couldn't do anything but just start heading home, start walking. And then my mind starts playing tricks on me. As I'm walking down that road and it's black, I mean, there ain't no street lights or anything and I'm looking all around and I'm walking down and all of a sudden a car comes and I'm thinking, man, they're gonna stop and pick me up. And this is no joke. I, when a car would come, I would run and I would hide. <laughs> So that car would go by and not see me. I know, I know. I was helpless. And I remember I'd run. As soon as the cars would leave, I'd run. I'd run as fast as I could. And finally, I finally got home and would run inside and go, Amy, I ran out of gas, sweat pouring down. I was scared to death. I was helpless. You know, I tell that silly little story to tell you this, though, this morning, church. I'm so glad this morning in our time of need, Christ will never leave. Hey, Christ is always there. You say, Brother Chad, oh, would he have brought you a gas tank? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, though, when I was scared and in my time of need, and no matter what your time of need is, either in the hospital, as some of you have been in the hospital this week, in time of need at a workplace, at time of need with your children, can I remind us in here, because Jesus lives, hey, there is help this morning. Because he lives, there is help, the Bible says. Hey, not sure what to do with your marriage? Just trust him, amen? He's there to help us. Not sure how to handle a rebellious child? Can I just say it this way? Hey, may we trust the one who is alive today and his name is Jesus. Not sure how to deal with a difficult person at work? I know no one ever has one of those types of people around them. Just learn to trust him. Not sure how to deal with a loved one that is sick? Trust him. See, this morning, may I just remind us in here, as I want to encourage each and every one of us, he lives, amen, he lives. What a joy to know that Jesus lives. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to see something. I'd like for you to take your Bibles. And I want you to put them over in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 31. I'd like to have this up on the screen. Don't have it up on the screen. But I want us to see this, if you have your Bibles. Romans, chapter 8, verse 31. As we're thinking about because he lives this morning, we have help. We have help. There is help. In verse 31, I like what it says here in the book of Romans. The Bible says here in verse, in chapter 8, verse 31, it says, What shall we then say to these things? Now look at this. If God be for us, whoo, this is good. Who can what? Be against us. You see this, Miss Michelle? Hey, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. He that spareth not his own son, but delivereth him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that dieth, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? who also maketh what? Intercession for us. You see, the help. Hey, in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril, peril or sword? As it is written, for they sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now look at this in verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other tree, creature, look, listen church, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Hey, because he lives, there is help this morning. Praise the Lord. Hey, this morning I thought about this. Because he lives, there is hope. Because he lives, there is help. But also because there lives, in verse 8, there is happiness. Amen? There's happiness. In verse 8 of Ch Matthew chapter 28, you can look back there. In Matthew 28, verse 8, the Bible says, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear. And look at these next two words. What? Great joy. 
with great joy and did run to bring the disciples word. What a joy it is this morning, church, to know our Savior lives. What a joy to know that the God that we serve, He's alive today. If we were to go to the tomb, you're not going to find it there. He is alive. Amen. We can be going through some of the toughest and darkest times in our lives, but yet still have joy in Him. Why? Because He lives. Because He lives this morning. Hey, we can have joy. I was thinking about as a teenager. Now, to some, this wouldn't be a tough time, but I was thinking about joy in my life, and I was thinking about one of the toughest times as a teenager, Miss Summer, you'll appreciate this, was when I left for college. And uh, when I left for college, now for some kids, they were probably, for some kids when you left for college and left mom and dad, you was like, yeah, woo, for me. I was a mama's boy. For me, it was tough. I, I didn't want to leave, and I can remember mom and dad sitting here. I can remember, I can see it now. We were in Conyers. And I packed all my stuff up, and I was heading to Pensacola, to Pensacola Christian College there. And I remember we went to we went to the uh, Waffle House there in Conyers. It's closed down now. And I remember we went there and had our last supper. And uh, we had our uh, last, we had breakfast that morning. And I remember as I got closer to to finishing up breakfast, and as a teenager and knowing I'm fixing to leave and fixing to leave home, and man, something it just started it really bothering. At first, I was you know excited, started. Bothering. And I remember I ate and I went and, and I looked at mom and dad and I gave them a big hug. I was trying to be all tough. Mom, tears coming down the eyes. Dad's high five my mom, say, yeah, he's finally out of here. I'm just kidding. And uh, he didn't do that. Tears coming out of their eyes. And I remember, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I got in the truck. I couldn't even get on the expressway. And I just started bawling, and bawling, and bawling. I think I cried all the way for six or seven hours all the way to Pensacola. And I remember I got there and I was a freshman, so I had to get there early. And I remember going into the dorm there and I got into the dorm and brought all my stuff. Nobody else was there and didn't know who my roommates were or any of that. And I remember there, I got there and, and I had the bed there and I had all my stuff and I just sat down, didn't know anybody. I just sat down on the bed. And I sat there and when I sat there, it just started hitting me. Mom, dad. And, and, and I know, I know I was a teenager thinking, who's going to iron my shirts? Who's going to cook me food? And all those things, and all true and truthfully, you start hitting. And at that point, I realized, you know what? All that mom and dad had done for me, and tears started crying, or, or started coming out. And I remember that. And I remember I wrote a letter. It was probably two or three page letter. Dad, you remember? And for, I don't know, I, for years and years, Dad would keep that letter in his pocket and all of it was in there just saying, Mom, Dad, I love you. Mom, Dad, thank you for all you've done for me. Mom, Dad, you are so special. Mom, Dad, I'm sorry for anything that I had done to disappoint you and all of those things. And I realized, you know what? And it brought me joy to know that Mom and Dad, though I, w I was going to go through tough times and though I was going to go through some heartache and though I went through some things there at school that wasn't easy, what a joy it was to know, hey, I could pick up the phone. We didn't have cell phones then. I had to run back to the dorm, pick up the phone, and I could call Mom and Dad. And they were right there. And what a joy, what a happiness. And can I just remind us in here, church, this morning, no matter what it is that you're going through, no matter what it is that you might be scared with, no matter what difficulties might be faced, you might be facing, there is a joy of knowing, yes, that Jesus is alive and he's there and he loves us and he cares for us and that should bring a happiness to us, amen? He is always there for us. No mom and dad wasn't right there beside me. I can say this, God is always right there with us and that should bring a happiness to us. Because he lives this morning, hey, there is hope. Because he lives this morning, there is help. Because he lives this morning, there is happiness. There is joy. And because he lives, and lastly, church, this morning, we see this. Because he lives, there is heaven. Amen? There is heaven. Take your Bibles and turn over this one verse here. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And look in verse 19. Look what the Bible says, and we'll close up here this morning. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. Verse 19, chapter 14. But ye see me. And then I like these words. Because I live, what's the Bible say? Ye shall live. 
also. Because I live, ye shall live also. Can I tell us the very best thing about Jesus rising from the grave? Hey, the day they thought they had him, the day they thought they had him sealed into the tomb, the day they thought that they had him captured, though on the third day Jesus arose and because of that, yes, there is a hope. Yes, there is help. Yes, listen to me this morning, there should be a happiness and a joy that we serve a risen Savior. But the very best thing is that there is a heaven for us. Amen. The very best thing, because he lives this morning, there is heaven. Here in the book of John, we see Jesus is speaking and he says, because I live, ye shall live also. How can we live when each and every day people are dying? I got a phone call yesterday of a lady at our previous church, just a godly lady, name's Miss Joanne. She took her last breath. But though she took her last breath on this earth, listen, when she took her last breath on this earth, she entered into glory in a place called heaven. How can we stay alive when others are taking their last breath on earth? The only the way that we can is if we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Bible says in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 1. Listen, the Bible tells us this. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I like this, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Church, can I just say this this morning? The very best thing that ever happened was when Jesus died on that cross. I am so grateful for it. You, maybe there might be somebody in here who says, I just don't know about all that Jesus stuff. I just don't know about all that Bible stuff. Oh, ma'am, sir, please don't question it. It's God's Word. This isn't what Mr. Chad, this isn't what Pastor Chad's saying. This is what God's Word says. And on that third day, he arose again. And because of it, we do have help. We do have hope. We should have happiness. There is happiness. But best thing, there is a place called heaven if we're saved and born again. I found this kind of a silly little story but I thought it was pretty fitting for the hour there's an old legend of a swan and a crane and maybe you've heard this story before and it goes like this the, the swan and the crane a beautiful swan alightened by the banks of the water in which a crane was waiting about was waiting about he was looking and seeking snails for a few moments the crane viewed the swan in stupid wonder and then acquired. Where do you come from, swan? said the crane. Oh, the swan said, I come from heaven. And then he said, the crane said, well, where is heaven? asked the crane. Heaven, said the swan. Heaven? Have you never heard about heaven? asked the swan. And then the beautiful bird, the swan, went on to describe the grandeur of the eternal city. She told of the streets of gold and the gates and the walls made of precious stones of the river of life, pure as crystal, upon whose banks is the tree whose leaves shall be for the healing of the nations. In eloquent terms, the swan sought to describe the host who live in the other world, but without arousing the slightest interest on the part of the crane. Finally, the crane looked at the swan and asked, Swan, are there any snails in heaven? With that, the swan said, snails? Why in the world would you want snails in heaven? Of course there's no snails in heaven. Then the crane looked at the swan and said these words. Well, as he was going upon that slimy pool banks looking for snails, he said these words. You can have heaven. I'll take my snails. And I got to thinking about that. What a silly little story, though. But how true it is that many times in our own lives that we will let the cares of this world and the things in this world that we think it will hold on to us and we'll say, I don't want this heaven. I'll take this and this and you can place the snails with whatever it might be that this world will try to offer us and try to keep us from going to heaven. But can I just say this, ma'am or sir, the very best thing that we could ever do and the very best thing that ever happened to me was when I received Christ as my 
and I lay down the world's goods and there's nothing, I'll be honest with you, there's no truck, there's no home and there's nothing wrong with these things, but I'm telling you, there's no lake, there's no boat, there's no anything worth me uh, keeping to miss heaven. I would rather lay it all down and say, God, listen, you're the most important thing in my life. And listen, you say, Mr. Chad, we gotta lay down our boats and all that. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying this is may we not let the world allow anything keep us from going to a place in heaven. Amen. Hey, the best reason that he lives because he lives, hey, is because there is hope, there's joy, there's happiness, there's help, but the very best thing is there is a heaven if we've received Christ as our personal Savior. One day when George MacDonald, the great Scottish preacher and writer was talking with his son, the conversation turned to heaven and the prophet's version of the end of all times. The son said this, he said, it seems too good to be true, talking about heaven. The son said at one point, the father, he smiled at his son and he said these words, nah. He replied, it's just so good, it must be true. It's just so good, it must be true. Listen to this this morning as I close. For those that are not saved and those that have never put their trust in Jesus Christ, you've never asked Jesus to come to your life, forgive you of your wrongdoings. Listen, you today, you are the closest to heaven that you will ever be. But without Christ, you will die and go to an awful place called hell. But for those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ and you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, listen, we are the closest to hell that we will ever be. Amen. And one day we're going to be able to see him face to face. Amen. Can I ask you this question, ma'am or sir? Have you ever asked Jesus Christ to come to your heart and forgive you of your sins? Has there ever been a time in your life that you just said, Lord, I know what you did for me on Calvary's cross. Please come to my life and save me. I believe you died on the cross for me. Please come to my life and save me. You see, people will hold on to snails and keep from going to heaven because they won't give up things. I can't get saved. I don't want to do that. Why would I want to do that? I, hey, throw out the snails. Heaven is far greater than anything else on this earth. Amen. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning. Because he lives, there is hope, there is happiness, there is help, but the very best thing is there is a place called heaven. And I wonder this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, can I just ask you, ma'am, sir, have you ever asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and to forgive you? Ma'am, sir, have you ever put your trust in Jesus Christ? The most important thing you'll ever do is ask Jesus to come to your life and forgive you of your sins so that one day you can experience heaven. And I wonder with nobody looking, if somebody just say, you know what, Brother Chad, that's something I've never done, but that's something, Brother Chad, that I'd like to know more about. Now, Pastor Chad, don't embarrass me, don't call me out, but Pastor Chad, just pray for me. I promise you I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you, but I would like to pray for you. I wonder in here this morning if there might be a, be a man, a woman, maybe a, maybe a teenager, somebody says, you know what, Pastor Chad, I've never asked Jesus to come to my life and forgive me of my sins, but just pray for me. Anybody like that, just raise their hand. Say, Pastor Chad, that's me. I see that hand. Anybody else? Say, Pastor Chad, I've never done that. I've never done that. I've never asked Jesus to come on. That's what I want us to do with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. We're going to stand. We're going to have a song of invitation. All those that are willing and able to stand this morning. If you raise your hand this morning and you're not for sure that heaven's your home, you can get it settled today. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, nobody's looking. And if you would this morning, maybe you didn't raise your hand. Maybe you're not for sure. We have men that will show men how they can know for sure heaven's their home. If you're a lady, we can have a lady show you. Don't leave here today without knowing that heaven is your home. And as we begin to sing, maybe if you raise your hand, if you didn't, we'd love to show you in God's Word how you can know for sure. If you'll take that first step, God promise you, hey, we'll help you. We'll help you. God will help you this morning as we sing.